no, you can do software dramatically better, but if you haven't seen it, it's hard to believe it. Welcome to the LabVIEW experiment. I am your host, Sam Taggart from SAS Workshops. In my 15 years of working with and training developers, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of experiments. Over here, we believe in embracing failure as the essential learning experience that it is. And what better way to learn than from other people's mistakes? In this podcast, I talk to industry experts, colleagues, and friends about their failures and how they have turned them into future successes. So uh, I am here today with Kyle Arate. Uh, I met Kyle through uh, a friend of mine, Llewellyn, who invited me to a dinner party, and Kyle and I started talking there, and then we met at one of the Agile Denver meeting, meetups. And we had a very, very interesting conversation that I think illuminates a lot of the struggles people have with trying to adopt different uh, ways of doing things. So does that, that about sum it up? Do you want to go yes. into your whole uh, distinction? I, of the different I even have trouble talking to people, right? And I say, hey, I want to do this thing. And I use a word. And I, maybe I use the word agile. And the fact is, if I use the word agile, there's eight people listening to me and 12 different meanings in their heads about what I meant when I said agile, right? And so trying to say, hey, we're going to do this thing the failure of communication is so large that I, I've been working for a couple months on trying to just clarify what the heck we're talking about. Yeah. Right? No, and I, I, yeah. I, I really liked your, your, the way you classified it there. You had like four different groups, four different things or yeah. stages or something that people work through. Yeah. So here, let me just give them to you right up front. I actually have five. Okay. My class. If you are doing software, you are probably explicitly or implicitly pursuing a primary goal. And it's not that your goal is the software you're working on. It's your goals about the software you're working on. And so I got five goals that are very stable as far as I can tell. And here they are. Number one, get it done. <laughs> Completion. How many times have you been in software and heard somebody say, when will it be done? How many times have you been in software and heard people not be able to say any single other thing about the software except when will it be done? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, there, there's definitely shops goal. out there that do that. Yeah. Um, second goal. Usually you see it after somebody's been, when will it be done for a while? right? They go, wait a minute, our software breaks. Our software is janky. It falls apart. We can't make changes safely. So what we're going to focus on instead is stability. I want my software to be stable. I don't want it to break if I look at it wrong. Mm -hmm. The real goal, there's a lot of people going that way. I would argue that the intelligent move to waterfall processes was driven by an interest in stability over let's get it done. Okay. Three, efficiency. If your software is getting done and it ain't broken, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. which is a stretch, then an awful lot of the time what people move to is can we do it faster and cheaper? Can we do it more efficiently? And so I'm using efficient as tag number three, but efficient to me is narrowly faster and cheaper. We have a project, it takes a year or two to do the project. Is there any way we can do this project in six months instead? Is there any way we can do it faster? Can we hire folks who aren't as expert and still get it done, right? There's a whole bunch of work on optimizing for faster and cheaper. And that's a real path to doing software. Um, you see a lot of stuff go on there. You see people start to talk really in terms of cycles, like mm -hmm. quarterly planning cycles and things like that. Those kinds of things start coming up and you start seeing people look at value stream mapping and waste mitigation. 
right? How do we remove the waste from our process? We're still going to do the same things. We're still going to do them basically the same way, but we're going to take out that part over there where you have to wait four weeks for somebody to get to something, mm -hmm. right? It's an efficiency goal. And I'm worried that a lot of large companies, if somebody says, hey, let's do agile, they're really talking about the efficiency goal. And that's all they're talking about. Um, in fact, if I was arguing, I would say, I think safe leans into that goal. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, for what it's worth, I am not objecting to any of these goals. These are all real goals that real people have, and you can have these goals for good reasons. Yeah. So I am not objecting to the goals. I'm simply trying to separate them so we can talk about it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think there is something about having the language to talk about these things, right? Because like observing them is one thing, but until you can actually verbalize it and talk about the differences, you can't have a productive conversation. <laughs> uh, um, that's maybe the best thing about the patterns book too, right? Yep. It gave me words to say, no, 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 I want to do adapter here. Yep. I don't want to do adapter. I want to do observer. Oh, really? You want to do observer? Oh, Okay. Right. And you can actually communicate about the topic. Yep. Um, number four on my list is responsive. The original Agile Manifesto basically said, look, things are going to come up. Things are going to change. We're going to have to turn Craig Larman's original definition of Agile from way back in like 01 or 02 is you can turn on a dime for a dime. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to make a change when I learn something new, right? That's, that's a real goal. When you start looking at that, you start going, gosh, I can't have my test team in a different building or different continent than my dev team. They have to be one team, mm -hmm. right? And maybe the deployment people get together and they're one team. And maybe the product people show up and they're part of the team. And so you start talking about real changes in organizational structure in order to <clears throat> actually be able to respond. Yeah. So right? and I have a question. This is a huge win, I think, originally. So, so you mentioned most companies stop at that previous level. Is that because it's too difficult to do the reorganization or they don't want to? Or is it the the value thing that like they just don't value the ability to be able to turn they're they're more interested in the efficiency part? That's a really hard question, and I'm sure it varies by company. I have seen organizations that fundamentally don't care, right? They're doing agile because somebody said we should do agile, not because they are pursuing a goal with agile, right? And so what happens is, these changes are easier and these changes are harder. Mm -hmm. And so we do the easier changes because we never bothered to clarify, here's the goal I'm actually pursuing. Yeah. And here's how important it is compared to the rest of my stuff. And without that clarification, well, Kyle's saying you should do TDD. That means that you actually have to be working together with the developers on getting better at how we write code. Uh, Fred over there, I don't know Fred, by the way. Fred over there is saying, you should have a quarterly planning meeting. Which one's easier to do? Come on, we're going to do Fred's thing. Yep. Right? Again, it's because partly nobody has a language to talk about Agile and then go, no, no boss guy. Pick a goal. Pick how much we're willing to trade off in order to achieve this goal. Mm -hmm. Because until you do that, you're kind of throwing practices at random or just purchasing the first discount framework you can find at Walmart. Yeah, I think a lot of times we lose sight of the goal. Like, I don't I don't know if it's that we lose sight of it or maybe we never even defined it a lot of times, I think is part of the problem too. Um, and it's more than that, right? If you look at large organizations and organizational politics, what you're getting is an awful lot of it is coalitional decision-making 
And what we don't have a goal in terms of a formally declared goal. What we have is coalitional power structures and whose favors are being traded with whose in order to get organizational influence. And so maybe there isn't even a goal, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't have one. It's that we're thinking in terms that, uh, that aren't what's really going on. When I talk about software, I want to move towards maybe responsive or maybe level five software. And somebody else wants to be more in charge of more decisions and be promoted. If that's really the goal, then what am I talking about? I'm talking about a different thing. I'm talking about how you're optimizing your software. And that's maybe orthogonal to a lot of real concerns by senior decision makers. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I totally get that. Um, so uh, yeah, let's, uh, what is level five? Then we didn't get to that yet. And so level five, I call discovery right now. I've, ch I've changed the words a little bit, but level five, I'm calling discovery. And I'll tell you a cute thing that I'm doing in a minute. Um, I'm calling level five discovery. And really the idea is once you can deliver software on a weekly cadence, nobody cares if you go a lot faster, right? If I can deliver working chunks of software at the end of the week, every week, and it's clear value to the customers every week, there's nobody who is saying, but why can't we do it every day? I mean, occasionally somebody will say, well, can we do a midweek deployment this week? But nobody's really pushing for, but can we have this in two hours, right? That's not the thing we're chasing. What we start going is I can build this stuff so fast that I can find out what I should really be building, right? The single, okay, so the first experience every programmer in the world has had is you write code, and you push the button and it doesn't work and you have to debug it and you spend more time debugging than you do right. Mm -hmm. Right? That's everybody's done that. The second experience literally every programmer in the world has had is somebody says, can you build me something that is blue? And so you write some code and it comes out blue and they say, I don't want it blue. I want it green. Yeah, right? or that's not the shade I yeah. wanted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really annoying. No, I literally remember sitting up at midnight, moving stuff across the screen one pixel at a time and like moving it one direction. They're like, no, that's not good. Move it back. And I'm like, really? Yeah. <laughs> right. So like all of us in programming know that a written requirement is basically worth nothing, right? The written requirement tells you what your first guess is, and then you're going to deliver it. And then you're going to find out the second guess. Mm -hmm. And maybe by guess four, we've actually figured out what the customer needs. But the written requirement, that's like guess one. Like really, that's all it is. So what you start getting the ability to do once you start dropping under a week is to have a better learning cycle, a better discovery cycle. Hey, how about I push out three versions to three different subpopulations and find out which one works best, right? And you start getting the ability to respond in that kind of way to a discovery model of software rather than a, oh, let's finish it or, oh, let's, let's just respond when we notice. Instead of responding when you notice, you go looking for the information up front because you're fast enough to be able to do so. Yeah, that is very interesting. Yeah, I, I never really thought about that proactive learning part of it. Like, I, I feel like I'm in that last group, but I, I was never like, I was never doing it saying, oh, I'm going to go learn. I'm just like, hey, the sooner I get them what they what they don't want, that I find out what they want kind of. Well, well but as soon as you start doing that a little bit, you go, wait a minute, can I build in monitoring here so that when I push it to the customers, <clears throat> have statistics to determine that this version isn't as good in terms of click through as that version, mm -hmm. right? And can I get that information on a 
inside of an hour? And can I turn it around and make a decision about which version to use in that? Can I automate that? Mm -hmm. Right. Hey, if I write this code, what's the performance like? How fast am I going to learn what the performance is? And so you start optimizing for speed of learning instead of speed to customer because customers don't care if you're doing faster than a week, more or less. Right? So my, my next question, I guess, is how, how do all the various practices that are sold as agile and, and the various frameworks, how do they fit into this? Uh, um, so I'm going to give a really simple answer and then we can look at it more uh, interestingly. If, if a practice is talking about things you do and you do it on a time frame that is, let's say, less than a week, mm -hmm. you're probably moving in ways that help us to optimize for learning. If you're talking about something or your practice is focused on timeframes that are weeks or maybe a month, you're probably talking about responsiveness. If you're talking about stuff that's operating on quarters, you're probably talking about efficiency discussions. If you're talking about practices that are generically somehow better, but you're not talking about doing it repetitively every cycle, you're probably going to end up talking about stability. And everybody knows that if somebody's asking, when will it be done? Yeah. Right? We're, we're talking about completion. So as an instance, SAFE's practice of agile release trains, that is an efficiency focus very clearly. If somebody's talking release trains, they're talking efficiency, right? I'm pretty certain of that. If somebody's talking value stream maps and your value stream maps are quarters or year to get from, hey, customer wants something to the customer is using the thing, you're still probably talking about efficiency. If somebody's yelling about bugs, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're putting in things to make sure it doesn't break and it's okay that this thing you put in slows you down, we're talking stability, mm -hmm. right? Um, code review is a stability move. Um, architecture review boards are a stability move. Those are the big ones. Uh, that I tend to look at. Um, if you have a weekly status meeting with executives that says, hey, which things are done? How close are they to done? Red, green, yellow, are they done? Where red, green, yellow is not. How good are they, but are they done? Mm -hmm. Right? You're probably talking completion. I put most traditional agile practices into the responsiveness category. Hey, we finished something in two weeks. Now we can show it to you, a user, and find out if that's what they wanted. Cool. That's a responsiveness play. Hey, I'd like to uh, plan two-week cycles. I would like to get together in the mornings every day and make sure we're all aligned. Okay, well, maybe we're talking about learning. It's probably still responsiveness. Hey, I want to get together in the mornings and find out how much we're on track. That's probably leaning towards efficiency more than responsiveness, right? So I can see standups going either way. Um, Code reviews, clearly a stability practice. Trunk-based developments, clearly a, look, I want to run my cycle in minutes, mm -hmm. right? Those are, you do that if you want learning speed, if you want to find stuff out faster, right? I'm mm -hmm. inclined to say that if you pick a practice, let's talk about the duration or the cycle time of the practice, and we can guess pretty well what where it falls.
into the process. Yeah, the, the other yeah. thing I, I'm kind of thinking about in this discussion is that some of these things are very much at odds, right? So stability versus being able to change, right? Like if, you know, like, for example, like if you're a, a kayaker, I'm not a big kayaker, but, you know, a sea kayak is designed to track straight and it's long and it's narrow uh -huh. and it's really fast straight. You try to take it down uh -huh. white water and you can't turn. You take a little play boat and it, you can turn on a dive, but you try to paddle across a bay, it's really hard because you're constantly course correcting because it wants to go all over the place. It's squirrely. So love it. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, my favorite example would be um, code review versus trunk based development. They're just not going to work very well, right? You do your trunk based development and you deploy, right? That's, you don't do your trunk based development and then wait six months for somebody to check your code. You don't even have room to wait six hours for somebody to check your code. Six minutes is pushing it, right? Yeah. You can't actually run code review in that world. So you're pretty much stuck choosing. Either you're pursuing responsiveness, you're pursuing discovery and trunk-based development, or you're giving up on discovery and responsiveness and you're pursuing stability with um, uh, code review and architecture review and phase gates and the things that give you stability but don't shake up anything really so, so I, I find a lot right? of people the like, only thing they do is say you know what i, I was just gonna say i, I find that a lot of people in in more regulated industries tend to favor that stability more like have you found ways to to kind of nudge organizations in that direction and like Part of my question is, is it even worth nudging organizations that direction? Like if they don't care about, because it, cause it's so easy to sit there and see somebody doing something and be like, well, it could be better, blah, 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 blah. But like, if they don't value the same things you do, like, are you just wasting your time? I'm going to say it takes more work to institute trunk-based development than it takes to institute code review. Right? Now. Do I think that if you're doing trunk-based development and TDD and ensemble programming and uh, good test automation that's optimized for uh, fast running and test optimization, op test automation that you optimize for ease of change rather than stability? If you're doing that, can I beat the stability of the stability people? Yeah, I think I can. But the shift is that big, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not 100% sure, right? Uh, I've been teaching security off and on for a long time at a lot of places. And what my biggest line at this point in security is, what's your biggest security problem? The users? It's the one that shows up tomorrow. Yeah. Right? yeah There's going to be something new discovered tomorrow and you're going to have to respond to it. So when I think stability, like for real on the security side, I think that the giant win for stability is, can you make changes to your code safely? I think that's most of security at this point. Well, so I was at this on conference the other day and there was a guy there talking and he worked for some big retailer. He, he was a consultant and they were only allowed to deploy like, you know, once a month in the middle of the night or something. And basically, you know, they were all their stuff was failing because they were putting together these big batches. And, you know, when you the more things you try to change at once, the more likely something breaks. And then, you know, it's hard to fix because you don't know which one of the 10 changes broke it. And, you know, they had this uh, policy where you couldn't release it all during Black Friday or whatever. But like I kept, I kept thinking like, OK, yes, they don't want you to change anything in Black Friday, but if. In the middle of Black Friday, they find a bug. How quickly do they want you to fix that bug? Right? And so well, all your changes but, take place and there are all these long drawn out things. Is that really what you want in the middle of Black Friday when you find a bug in the middle of Black Friday? Like you're setting yourself up for failure there. 
Because at some point you're going to have a bug in the middle of Black Friday and your things are going to go down and you're not going to be able to update because you, you know, your process to update, it takes way too long. It does. The pr- so one of the things that I have, uh, one of the things that I have difficulties with is I, so that is for lack of any other words besides mine, um, that's a responsiveness mind frame, right? As you're talking about stability and you're talking about efficiency, people, when you think that way, you think in terms of how are things going to go when they go according to plan? Let's make our plans better and we can go along with our plan, right? And Mm -hmm. Maybe I want my plan to run faster, but I'm still basically going with my plan and I trust that my plan's going to work. <laughs> the responsiveness people turn <clears throat> that on the head and go, the plan's not going to work. I know the plan's not going to work. I don't know how it's not going to work. So mm-hmm. what I want is the ability to respond when the plan doesn't work. Mm-hmm. That's a f- fundamental as my buddy likes to say it's a mindset shift right do you expect the plan to work or do you expect the plan to fail if you expect the plan to fail you build a responsiveness system if you expect the plan to work you build an efficiency or a stability system those are different models if you super expect the plan not to work, you build a discovery model. <laughs> figure out what the plan is or should be. Or, yeah. <laughs> to figure out what the next three steps should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, right? I wonder, and, is part of it like a lack of humility that they that people just think they can predict the future or they, they just don't realize how many variables there are or what what's the... If you say we are going to produce a 20 page report at the end of the week, Mm -hmm. next week. Can you do that? Yes, you can. What are the odds that that doesn't go right? That you can't produce the 20 page report? Quarter of a percent, right? Somebody dies or gets super sick or, right? Mm -hmm. But you can always produce the report. What about an accounting report where you collect all the data? What's the limiter on that? Well, if you throw enough hours at the problem, you can get the data and you can compile it and you can display it. I think that the fundamental problem is that programming is different. We we can fail. You can build something and it can not work. Mm -hmm. And throwing more hours at the problem will frequently increase the bug count as your developers get more tired, Mm -hmm. right? You don't have a linear relationship between inputs and outputs. You don't have an ability to hack your inputs into outputs. None of those things are there. And so what you're dealing with is instead of a, uh, Instead of a system where more effort can guarantee success, you're dealing with a chaotic system, a system in which adding inputs won't necessarily give you the output. And those are not the kind of system that business people are optimized around. That's where I think the problem is, is it's fundamentally a different kind of problem. Because there are problems. Hey, I need to put a thousand cards in the envelopes. Well, I guess that's a lot of hours, isn't it? Let's go. We get it done by working harder. In software, work harder, make more mistakes because you're too tired, right? So managing both types of systems is just hard because they work differently and the intuitions that you learn on this type of system are different than the intuitions you get over here. 
So that's very interesting. So you're saying it depends on the type of the task. Because because my original thinking on this topic was that it had to do with the time frame that you're planning, right? Because if you're planning what you're doing later today, there's a lot more certainty than what am I going to do on f- next week? And what am I going to do next month? Right? Because there's more time and there, more opportunity for things to go wrong. Well, but still, I'm going to tease you for a minute. So how many times has somebody asked you in your life where you say, hey, how how long will it take to finish this chunk of the programming? Yeah, you go, yeah. oh, yeah, it's about an hour. And a week later. <laughs> it's still not done. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because those things happen. And you're absolutely correct. If you ask me to estimate our tasks, it's below 5% that it's more than four hours, right? (laughs) But it still happens sometimes. If you ask, and so the further out, the worse you predict. But there's still a baseline level of uncertainty where you're going in. I'm going to go in and I'm going to try this and it's probably going to work and I hope it's not horrible. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a long- It just doesn't exist in the world. Yeah. Well, there's a long tail in the distribution too, right? Because you could run into some showstopper bug that like the thing that they want to do just isn't possible, right? (laughs) Right. And And no matter how much time you throw it, it's not going to work. 20 page report. How many showstopper bugs that will change it to a 500 hour task are there? They just don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Or like the, not even the showstopper bug, like they want to make a change that like basically takes your entire architecture and just flips it upside down. It's like, yeah. 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 I think a lot of that. Now, I, of course, want to, I want to argue. I don't tend to argue. I want to argue that if you have a goal, whether it be completion, stability, uh, efficiency, responsiveness, I can do all of those better by chasing discovery hard enough. But the change to your organization grows with every step. Yep. So, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and so maybe it's not worth it. Well, another interesting thing, too, I, I was talking to Jay Bazuzzi the other day at this uh, conference, and he was saying that like people can only see so far ahead. So if you're in level one, you might understand level level two seems maybe achievable. Level three seems like eh, crazy, but maybe. But you go to level four, five, like they can't, like your mind just can't make that leap. You can't jump. And so if you're like trying to sell, if you're trying to sell the sell learning to an organization that's stuck at just get it done, like you're, you're never going to do it. Yeah. Like they, they just can't possibly comprehend so, it. Um, legitimately, I've never seen an organization try, let's go to learning and discovery without having an executive imported who's lived it before. And they're going, like, how can you do anything else? This is so obviously better, (laughs) right? Yeah, that's kind of the point where I am. And I I have to couch myself when I'm talking (laughs) to people because I I, I start saying stuff to them and they look at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, why would you not do this? Yeah, They come up with all the reasons and I'm like, well, Okay, but that doesn't stop you from doing it. And they're like, no, 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 we, you don't understand. And I'm like, eh. so. Yeah, well, it's it's just the gap, right? How, I think I can do stability better with a discovery model where legitimately I deploy every couple hours to production. That's That's the world I want to live in. How much better is my stability if I'm doing that than if I'm doing good, safe code review and architecture review and requirements review and careful testing before every single deploy? Legitimately, it's not that much better. I mean, it's better and it's there's real value there, but the cost of the change is really high. even if the cost of the change was big enough it's impossible to see mm-hmm. like you said so i'm going to do stability things and keep my review boards and keep my phase gates and keep because i'm optimizing stability 
if you want to switch and optimize efficiency and do quarterly releases instead of annual releases or when we're done releases, okay, let's switch to efficiency. Efficiency is a good goal. But switching to efficiency, we can very, very rarely see, oh yeah, we've got a jillion, we, we, if we were doing this in a learning model, like, so I always like this example. Once upon a time, I was at one large company and I said, hey, how long to do this thing? 5% discount for veterans on Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. They said, give me two weeks, we'll give you an estimate. <laughs> and their estimate came back as a quarter and a team and a quarter million dollars. And I looked at that and went, I could have done this in two weeks if your architecture resembles same. Mm -hmm. How about me and a tester for a week? And let's call it 25K, right? But I said, you know what? I've got this humility thing going on. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. How about we do this instead? How about I go visit a Silicon Valley company and check with them? So I went and visited the Silicon Valley company um, and said, hey, 5% discount on Veterans Day. Uh, do y'all do projects like that? How long would it take? They said, oh, we just finished. I said, great. How long did it take? Well, I did it by myself in 15 minutes for 250 bucks. <laughs> That's stock options, by the way. Yeah. An organization that was optimized for learning was able to legitimately cut the cost of a project that was a stability centric organization by a factor of a thousand. Both cost and time were down by a factor of a thousand. Come on, what's going on there? Well, no, you can do software dramatically better, but if you haven't seen it, it's hard to believe it. The cynic in me says there's also a lot of people trying to justify their jobs and caught in the middle of that. Like there's a lot of middle management and project managers and stuff who are like, well, if we did it better, then they wouldn't need me. I don't know, maybe um, that's just me being extra cynical. There's the extra cynical version. There's also the like, hey, what about the changes, right? Um, one of the things that I've observed over time is, let's, let's talk about the story of light. This is one of my favorite economics examples that I use. Um, I'm making up numbers. They're not very far made up. So we'll just go with my bogus numbers. In the year 4000 BC, at the dawn of the Egyptian dynasties, right? You're going along and you, an average man on the street, have somehow tripped your way into learning how to read and you want to read for an hour at night after the sun goes. How many hours do you have to work to get an hour of light during the dark? Well, we're going to burn oil, right? Specifically, we're going to burn like olive oil. Mm -hmm. cool it costs you like a week of work a week of la your labor will buy you an hour of light after dark cool fast forward fast forward fast forward here we are in uh 2020 2023 how much of your salary suppose we're an average american how much of an average American's salary, how much of their, how many minutes or hours or days of their salary does it take to get an hour of light at night? Yeah, probably like. I think it's a second. Yeah, second minutes, yeah. Something like, like legitimately, I think it is, I am sure it is less than 10 seconds. It may be one second or yeah, less. Yeah, it's gotta be ridiculous. I mean, yeah, it's got to be ridiculously small. Electricity is cheap compared to... So we, we have shifted from a full 70-hour work week, 70 times 3,600, 
seven times four, we're talking about like 30,000, hour 25, 28, 25, 250,000 seconds maybe mm -hmm. is what I'm talking about versus one second. So here's the question. Which area uses more light? Turns out that it's not like we're using less light because it got cheaper. We use more of it. Mm -hmm. I'm somewhat less worried that we don't need the project manager. I think we will need the project manager. It's just we need them to do more different things mm -hmm. because once you can run software projects on very, very short cycles, we need other layers of coordination more. Yeah. Well, you, you need somebody to cast the vision and to, to kind of direct. Yeah. And yeah. collect so all that. that's where I am on that. That doesn't mean that's where everybody is. That doesn't mean where everybody should, should be, but it is certainly where I am on this. Yeah. I don't know. I, I have a somewhat cynical take on project managers, and that is there are a small handful who are amazing and absolutely amazing, and there are a lot that just really suck. But maybe that's just also my jaded experience as well. So, but I mean, I, I do remember a handful that I was just like, these people are amazing. Like, you know, I would work on any project with them. So, like, the distribution curve is. is... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to say, look, the, the space shuttle software was built using a brilliantly done waterfall process. Yep. You can do a lot of things really well. The problem is some of them rely, a lot of them rely on them being done well rather than being done part way. Yeah. Well, so I get what you're saying about the space shuttle and, and yeah, like the, the methodology for how they developed and the technology and stuff. But then you have the counter example, which is SpaceX, which is doing all this, you know, they're much more of an agile style, or at least they portray themselves that way. How much they actually are, I don't really know, but. I have the impression that they are and their biggest, like my favorite thing that Musk says is, look, I know the requirements are wrong. I don't know which requirements are wrong, <laughs> Yeah. right? And I don't know how they're wrong, but we're sure that the requirements Right. And he walks into stuff like that and going with, I know the requirements are wrong is your foundational line starts shifting how you approach like literally everything. You can't run the plan centric models. You can't run a cowboy model. You have to actively go after finding out where you were wrong. Ooh. Super interesting. Yeah, but when you're doing that, though, right, you, you still have some, like, long-term vision of where you want to go, right? The, that maybe gets yeah. updated as you go, right? As you learn more, you might change that. Yeah. But at every step, you're, you're, you're thinking, how can I get closer to wherever it is I think I want to go at that point in time? I mean, I, I, I use the football player example. Hey, you know what I'm doing in football? I am building a play. I build a play. I start the play. I know what the first two seconds of the play are supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And then one dude jumps over some other dude and I didn't write that down, <laughs> right? Jump over that dude. It was not in the play. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's just, right? You have a goal. We are clearly going that way to the end zone. We have a clear next three yeah. steps. Yeah, and then the quarterback throws an interception and now you're on defense suddenly. Right? Or or the ball gets right. 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 No. And so you 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 have to respond to the world as it is rather than the world as you thought it might be 15 seconds ago. Yeah, so so I heard it explain once like sometimes like planning is like I want to drive from here to DC. So I'm going to take a snapshot of all the red lights and all the intersections, all the traffic right now and I'm going to use that to make my plan. Well, obviously the traffic and the red lights and stuff are going to change before you get there. So like you have to respond to yeah, those well, things. If, if you're in the kind of domain 
that needs responsiveness. Hey, you know what you're going to do tomorrow morning? I don't know if you do this, but I think you're going to wake up tomorrow morning, get dressed, get ready to go outside, bend down and tie your shoes. How detailed could I give directions on tying your shoes? Like legitimately, I can tell you where to move which finger when. If you follow the instructions, you'll successfully tie your shoe. Tying your shoes is always the same. Brushing your teeth is always the same. Putting on pants one leg at a time, like everybody but Superman, is always the same, right? It's not like these are things that require adaptation. Some things you can just do them and you can reliably follow the plan. Yeah, Other well, th those are the can't... things that we get to the point where you just do it automatically, like brushing your teeth. You don't even think about it, right? Tying your shoes. How many people right. actually you do it the same driving way. a car? The same even. way I do now. Like just driving yes. the car to work, right? Like even that, you're on autopilot. Now that still changes. Red lights still change and stuff, but somehow your autopilot still seems to figure that out. Yeah, but I, I think it's worthwhile to keep track of how how different domains require different levels of responsiveness. Now, I think that anything anywhere near software is an adaptive domain, but what what your goal is, or maybe meta goal, right, will determine the right path. If you just go, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna have a meeting every morning and we're gonna plan every two weeks. I don't know if that gets you far enough. I, th I think you really have to take seriously the notion I am adapting, I, I, I'm targeting responsiveness. Mm -hmm. Here are things I'm doing to get to responsiveness. What am I gonna do about that? Mm -hmm. um, I think huge chunks of the mismatch are, Scrum was built as a responsive model. The managers trying to implement Scrum aren't pursuing responsiveness. They're pursuing efficiency or is it done yet? Yeah, no, there's a lot of that, yeah. Right, and so if if you know that Scrum is an optimization for responsiveness, not an optimization for is it done yet, then, well, you might decide what parts of Scrum you don't need. Yeah, that's interesting. So I had an interesting conversation the other day about uh, story points. Where, where do those kind of fall and fit in? Story points are somewhere around efficiency to low responsiveness. They disappear at the high end of responsiveness. Like I find story points to be pretty useful if your goal is to deliver what you predicted mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. When I'm running weekly sprints, I hate story points, right? they are worth less than what we're doing. If I'm doing daily or hourly releases, if you bring up story points, I'll punch you. Yeah, well, I right? mean, we're not I don't doing use that. Them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I basically just right, do but, the Kanban but, thing of like, you know, we prioritize them, we grab the longest one, and who cares how long it takes? But I could but see some value. Pursuing um, efficiency, instead of responsiveness yeah like safe or like the way a lot of large organizations use scrum questionably well story points are actually useful in those contexts but right see, they're not yeah. actually oh. well i was just thinking like I could see if you were working in a like a Kanban style thing, I could see that being useful just to like track over time and say, hey, is my output suddenly dropping or going up or down? Although I don't know that that really matters. Like, I mean, the ultimate measure, right, is like, what am I delivering to the customer and are they happy with it? And if they're happy with the progress that I'm making, why do I care if I'm doing 10 story points a week or eight or five or 12 or whatever it happens to be, right? So there's a mild valuation problem in terms of, hey, I have a hundred options for what I could build next. Mm -hmm. And so making a decision about which one I should build next 
when some things are higher value and some things are harder and trying to do the trade-offs, whether you do safe weighted shortest job first or whether you do some sort of division problem or whether you just go, no, screw it, we're just going to look at high value. If you do no estimates, then you say, hey, all stories are small enough to work, mm -hmm. right? And we care about the variance between them. There's lots of room, but somebody has to decide what goes first and what goes first. It's probably some sort of value per time calculation, right? Even if this thing's the most valuable thing, if it's going to take me six weeks, maybe I don't want to do that compared to the second most valuable thing, which takes six hours. Yeah. Well, part of it too is the idea of a task that takes six weeks just seems crazy to me. Cause I, I, I mean, <laughs> like I can have a goal six weeks out, but like to me, a task is like something I can do in a few hours or a day. If it takes longer than that, like I haven't broken it down enough or at least so maybe again, my, my a yes. But again, this is a responsiveness or discovery model, right? Yeah. That's how responsiveness and discovery folks think. Okay. Not so I'm just operating from a different model. Work. Right. Like, well, that, that, that explains a lot of the conversations I have with people and why they look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm just working in a different model. Right. They're walking in going, hey, what is our real, um, how long is it going to take? They're not thinking in terms of breakdown because they don't care about the breakdown. They care about, wait for it. When will it be done? Okay. <laughs> right? That's the thought process going. And maybe they care that it gets done faster. But fundamentally, the thinking problem is not how do we confirm as we go that we are finishing pieces and successfully progressing, right? Mm -hmm. Which is how a discovery person goes, hey, Look, it says six weeks, so I'm going to break it down into 40 tasks over those six weeks. I'm going to build one and check that it worked. And I'm going to add on to it and check that that worked. And then I'm going to build the skeleton that goes all the way through and check that that worked. And I'm confirming the whole way. If you're not confirming the whole way, what's the value of the smaller pieces? Yeah, you're right. Interesting. Except for the three of those checks which don't come back right and you go oh shoot i should be doing something else yeah yeah right mm -hmm. but there's real value to checking but if you're a if you're in the the plan is probably going to work model mm -hmm. again yeah that's that's very yeah. interesting yeah I, I often feel like i'm swimming upstream sometimes well again i think it's a communication problem and i have been failing for a very long time because I don't think pursuing efficiency on three-month cycles is a bad decision. It's never what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, like, yeah, it's it's just not the decision I would make, I guess. But then again, I, I mean, <laughs> right? maybe I'm operating under different constraints too. So, well, I'm willing to if that's what somebody is pursuing, great. Mm -hmm. I am happy to give them even suggestions on how to do it. If what you're doing is trying to learn or starting from I'm wrong, mm -hmm. or my, my words are always, I'm wrong a lot. Yeah, yeah. Right? If we're starting from I'm wrong a lot, then there's a whole lot of probe and respond. Mm -hmm. right? Probe, what's going to happen? What should we do? Is this what the customer really needed? Is it what's written down? Hey, how's the performance on this piece of code? Can we run it? Can we build a skeleton, a walking skeleton and performance test that thing? Those kinds of questions are things that we're going to be wrong a lot, make obvious. And we're going to be right most of the time, find completely unnecessary. Yeah, I guess the the big question then is how do you find clients who actually think that same way? Because I think that's probably a better strategy than trying to convince people who are in the other <laughs> suddenly 
jump over to my camp. My, my, my current line is calling out the distinction, right? Simply saying, look, there's several goals you could have. There are people who need this product out today. I've been in a startup. Mm -hmm. I have been CIO at a startup. When you are at a startup and you deliver, and sometimes it's like this thing goes out on this date or we all die. Yep. Right? Cool. Guess what? How much does stability matter? Shut up. Yeah, just get it out the door. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's yeah. going out the door on that date. Mm -hmm. Right? Some contract software shops work that way. It's going out the door on the day. Um, stability. If you take stability seriously, then maybe you go, okay, well, taking stability seriously means I'm going to slow some stuff down. Right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. we're going to do these things better and slow down. I'm going to make the trade-off great. Mm -hmm. But having that conversation with the person talking to you and going, look, I got five goals. I can pursue any of them. I can make trade-offs against any of them. Let's talk about our goals. Yeah. Right. I mean, Have yeah. that conversation. And <laughs> so, so two questions then to wrap things up. One is, are people, are people making this a conscious decision? And when you have this discussion with them, does it click in their head and do they immediately go, oh yeah, you're right. Or is there like some cognitive dissonance going on that they just don't realize what they're doing? Most people don't approach most problems as optimization problems, right? I think that's kind of a weirdo point of view, but, but if you point out that code review makes the code a little more stable and slows you down a little bit, mm -hmm. everybody will agree to that. And then you can say, look, Every practice you do is like that. You're making a trade-off here. Code review is stability against delivery speed. That's your trade-off. And maybe if your folks are good enough, you don't need the code review, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you want a cursory code review. Maybe we can optimize code review and we can run a model where we pull our head to developer off and he doesn't write code anymore. He just does code review, but he does it immediately. So you're not losing as much velocity, right? And so you can talk even about the trade-offs in the practices. Yeah, I, th I don't think most people have gone through and said, oh, this is a trade-off between this and this. Yeah, There's it, a lot of, well, obviously we're supposed to instead of, we are making a conscious decision to make this trade. Yeah, it's subconscious. But but do you find and, that the people who do those things, the subconscious, like if they're in that bucket, they subconsciously make all those decisions the same way anyway? Like they're not like contradictory or do they sometimes people? Uh, so when they make a decision that is contradictory, mm -hmm. they try it and it hurts. If you try to do... Uh, as an example, if you try to introduce trunk-based development in a code review heavy model, yeah, it's, it's just annoying. Yeah. Right? You're doing it, you're getting no value out of it, and it's taking a lot of work to churn through the rest of the molasses. And so eventually something gives. Either this one practice you're doing over here or these 40 practices you're doing over here that are all promoting stability. Yeah, and the easiest thing is to get rid of right? the it's rather than change the 40. Yeah. <laughs> right? So just for fun, the model I'm using in my head is main sequence stars. Completion is a black hole. Radiation isn't escaping from that one. If some radiation starts escaping, it warms up a little bit and the surface of the star turns red, which is stability. If you heat up a little more, you become orange. You're pursuing efficiency. 
If that heats up a little more, it becomes yellow. Now you're pursuing responsiveness. If you heat up more, you get to blue, which is uh, discovery, learning. Mm -hmm. Turns out it doesn't matter how hot you make the surface of your star after that, it stays blue. Okay. Right? So I'm using the stellar sequences and I'm using stars because each one of them has gravity. If you go to stability, you're stuck in stability without a lot of lift. If you go to efficiency, you're going to stay in efficiency and you're not going to move on to responsiveness. A lot of the things that get you stable and efficient are in the way of responsive. Yeah, there was a book once titled something like What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And I thought that was a great title. Yes. Not, yes. And so I'm talking gravity laws, right? And so I have these stars. And right now my working title is Blue Star Software Development, right? Because mm -hmm. you're talking about something that's a really hot thing and it's different and you have to exit your other gravity well to get here. And mm -hmm. honestly, the hardest part is exiting the old gravity well. Yeah, once you get it. out of it, then then it's easy to fall into the next one. <laughs> yeah. But also that goes to the thing of like, you can't jump too far ahead because you try to jump past it. And it well, just it turns it out. Well, so you, you can gravity assist your way around stars yeah. a lot of the time. And so the problem is we've, we've even seen research, uh, Shore and Larson have a model called the Agile Fluency Model in which they point out that if you start in your completionist black hole and you go to stability and then you move, they don't use stability as their word. But if you go to stability and then you go to efficiency and then you go to uh, responsiveness, it takes like 10 times as long as going directly to responsiveness. Hmm. Because, Wait, you oh, because you have to leave the gravity well each time right okay. yes okay, yes okay because because right. then that's you settle into that new way. comfortable thing and then you got to give up the new comfortable thing again and that's what costs the money like the energy is in giving up the comfortable thing yes right? so once you once yeah. you get the energy to give that up then you can jump anywhere because you you've yeah i mean it's still further to get to responsiveness yeah, yeah. than it is to get to stability it's just if you go to stability you're gonna yeah. get stuck there I yeah you gotta pay the cost to get out of yeah okay <laughs> that makes sense yeah that's a it's been a very interesting conversation so thank you for having me it's been fun uh and uh you'll have to give us uh some links and we'll throw them in the show notes on where people can uh read more and find out more about you so. uh sounds good uh linkedin for sure i sent you a bio um and i will probably have to build a website around this <laughs> All right. Well, very good. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of the LabVIEW Experiment. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or questions, head over to thelabviewexperiment.com and drop me a note. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the LV Experiment.